Hello and welcome to Hard Copy, coming to you from our studios in Abuja. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. Tuesday, December the 10th, was International Day of Human Rights. And my, was there a vibrant discussion on it, given recent happenings in the country? From attempts to regulate the social media and punish hate speech, to the re-arrest of former presidential candidate and revolution now convener Omoyele Shoure, there were more than enough examples to express what Nigeria is doing wrong with regards to human rights. Tonight, however, we take on a different example where the people complained and heed, it would seem, was paid to their cause for change. The NSARS campaign was a hashtag that went viral last year. It sought to end police brutality by a section of the force which was supposed to curb armed robbery and kidnapping in the country. The campaigns were so effective that the authorities couldn't look away. They came up with a slew of reforms which were supposed to rebrand and change the manner in which the organization works. But one year down the line, where are we? Tonight, I speak with Shegwan Wosoya, also known as Segan Link. He was one of the vibrant champions of the NSARS campaign and actively engaged with the authorities on reforms that were proposed and ordered. He's our guest tonight as we speak on what next after a seemingly successful social media campaign. Shagun Awosoya, welcome to Hard Copy. Thank you very much for having me in your program. Yes, what's the extension and that's your Twitter Le handle? <laughs> it means Sega the Awakener. I see, Le Veleur. So it's supposed to be a French, French term. French word, yes. I see. So what would you say your reading today of human rights is in Nigeria? I know a lot of people have talked about uh, how far, how much progress we've made since we returned, returned to, to democracy. And they will tell you that there are ups and downs, but what's your reading of where we are with regards to human rights? Yes, I believe that we have actually retrogressed. I believe that it has been a roller coaster ride. Um, what only change is the uniform that is not even present now. Uh, so we have men who have transited from military rule to civilian dictatorship. Right now we have a deformed democracy that is more or less looking as though we are in a fiefdom. And I don't think things are getting better. It's they are actually getting worse. And it is time that we all rise as citizens as one in unity to speak against this and uphold human rights in Nigeria. It is interesting that you hold this view in spite of the fact that you have had cause to engage authorities and they've listened. Mm -hmm. uh, so why do you still, why do you, why is this still your perspective? Um, sometimes it's good to see rivers as rivers and mountains as mountains, despite the fact that we are not quarreling with these entities. There's no fight or quarrel between organizations and the government. The only thing we're battling with is institutional gaps, which is spread across sectors. So what we need to continue to do is to tell the truth to power by letting them know where they are lagging and where we can help and where they need to collaborate with the people. They are not ruling over the people. They are actually serving the people. So feeling the pulse on the street is very essential for them if they truly want to progress Nigeria. So that is one of the reasons why we need to call a spade a spade. So it is not about hating somebody or it's not about fighting somebody or criticizing somebody harshly. It is about the truth. Sometimes the eyes that see does not see itself. Now, the reason I ask that question is about when you talk about a dictatorship, oftentimes when people talk about a dictatorship, it's about a government that doesn't listen, a government yeah. that no one can speak to. Yeah. yeah, people will make all the noise that they want to make, but it is the tra tra trajectory that government wants to take yeah. that it will take. Um, in this instance, and that's the reason I brought, about the, I brought up the NSARS campaign, yeah. you were one of the vocal champions for that. First and foremost, tell us what led to that and how government, you know, how you guys were able to make government listen. Okay. The thing is, in Nigeria, we have been so disconnected from ourselves and also from our institutions to the point where we have such gaps that does not make your education transit to the town. In other words, there's a disparity between the town and the gown, which is not supposed to be also gov uh, governmentally or institutionally. The, the, there is no connection between the institutions and the people. So the uh, bridge builders tend to come into this gap to begin to orchestrate or organize or galvanize that link that is missing. So oftentimes government listen only when there is political will behind such campaign. And what do I mean by political will? 
people must have what they call the conscious revolution paradigm, understanding the common grounds. What exactly makes this thing connected to me? How is it connected to me? Oh, fine, it is Shawere today. Could it, could it have been me? So until people begin to see themselves in that position, and that was exactly what led to the NSAT campaign. Actually, it wasn't just last year. It was the year before, and even the year before that. It's, it's now three years old. We started because I, I, I felt I wear different hats as a father, as, as an uncle, as a business owner, and also a member of society. I believe I cannot continue to think about myself alone, progress my business, make money, and not be able to live in the same society. Was that your hashtag? You said? Was NSAS your hashtag? Yes, please. It, it, it was the hashtag that we started with. NSAS, Reform Police NG. The NSAS itself is a call to action. No, what it's, I mean is, were you the one who started the yes, hashtag? Yes, please. Yes, it was my hashtag. Because we, when we started, we started with uh, uh, end bad SARS. That was how we started. Because we thought it was just a few of them. After a while, from data, we realized that it was actually a culture of impunity that we're engaging, which is not just about a few bad elements, but about a bad structure. But it wasn't just limited to SARS, which is the tactical squads, as it were. We only use SARS as the moniker for the entire thing. It, was, it includes anti-cultism, anti-kidnapping, especially all the SOS and several other uh, units and silos that they've built within that conundrum of tactical squads. They have totally lost their purpose and they have lost supervision as well. So everybody just does things that seem it right in their own eyes. So based on this, we just felt, let's start with these tactical squads. Who are the soldiers within the police system? So we engage that, and if you can see... That they keep saying we. Who are the we? Social Intervention Advocacy Foundation is the name of the institution stroke NGO that's actually in charge of NSAS, that actually brought that to fore, and which I'm privileged to be the founder and the president. So that's, it's a we thing, because we, there are so many collaborations within that. It's not just a one-man campaign. So when we brought about the homeland security threat, that is the threat by people who are meant to protect us, given that the, the, every civilization actually is upholded or upheld by the activities of law, 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 law and or, or order enforcers. But our law and order enforcers are obnoxious of the law. They don't even understand what the law is. They're oblivious to the law. They don't know what the law is. They don't even know what they're doing. They're just doing anything that they like. So it was when somebody just called, I think before then, before 2006, 17, people don't usually come out when police robs them. Because who do you call when a police officer assaults you or robs you? You can't go back to the same police officers. They will still extort you. So I felt there need to be a gap there. I, uh, there need to be a, build, uh, a bridge there to be able to you know, create a sukkah for people, a place for people to go to. But let's move forward because indeed uh, quite a, a lot of Nigerians who were on social media at that time followed the story and yeah. some of them retweeted. Some of them were appalled at the stories that were being shared on social media about the brutality of, of police. And at the end of the day, the authorities had to listen. Yeah. Uh, let, let, let us move forward from there. Yeah. What happened afterwards? Because I'm reading a story here. And this is done by Motolani Alake. I think she writes for Pulse Online. Uh, she says, what exactly is the state of, or the status of SARS? Which is what a lot of people are wondering. <laughs> It's not, it's not an Eldorado. You wanted, the hashtag said, end SARS. What we got was a reformation. <coughs> we got F, F, I think, federal SARS, which was the reformation that we were given. Um, and then there were supposed to be complaints attended to by the National Human Rights Commission. Yeah. What has happened from all of there? When we started engaging the police themselves, after they realized that they can't play to the gallery any longer or try to blackmail us any longer, we sat down and we thought about it. That was during why we were celebrating the uh, safe spaces for youth, as I did um, two years ago. We sat down and we told them everything, shared data with them and all. And they saw the, old, the true picture themselves and they felt something need, needed to be done. Then we agreed on what to be done. And we said a protocol must be put in place to mitigate against the occurrences and the incidences that we have on the streets. And that was why we, we had FSAS to centralize the entire operations of the tactical squad. It wasn't much of a reform because police cannot reform themselves. It has to be done through a legislative process, which we were also involved in to ensure that there is a bill. Because if you put a, a, a protocol in place, all you need to have is a change of ID and that protocol is going to be re re repealed. So what makes uh, the change permanent is actually having a bill that will be passed into law. So we have two bills. A uh, police reform bill and a police trust fund bill, both of which passed at the floor of the Senate. 
And the police trust fund bill also passed at the floor of the reps. But we are waiting for concurrence for the police reform bill because of some technicalities here and there. And after that has been done, there will be a, a board that will be constituted or inaugurated by the president and will monitor the implementation of most of the provisions in that law, which fundamentally also includes the combination of efforts from civil society organization and the public monitoring the police, just as we're doing right now. So it is not just enough for police themselves to manage themselves. There must be a feedback system. Police is not a force in a democracy. They are actually uh, a service. That's why they were formerly under the Ministry of Interior, which has immigration service, fire service, prison service, and the rest of them. You know, so because of that, they need constant monitoring to be able to come out of the woods of the years of impunity. It looks like they disagree in some ways because right now we've just seen a new restructuring. They're no longer under the Ministry of Interior. Yes. They've been on their own for a while, but now they now have a Ministry of Police Affairs. That's a policy from assault on the side of the government, and it was ill-advised. And we're still going to get to that point because we cannot continue to go back on our vomit each time. What is the essence of a reform if you are now making police stand alone when they can they have not choosing they have not even realized their essence in society and they have not they are not even making effort to win trust of the people. Mm. Mm. It's a problem because we not only do they not trust the police then when the NSAS campaign started. What I want to know is from that campaign have attitudes changed especially on the part of the police. Yes, it has. Even on the operations of police generally across Nigeria. We receive calls across Nigeria to get the feedback and then we share information with the police. We are working hand in hand with the police now. If you notice, police have not, they are no longer in that character of denial, you know, uh, refusal of uh, 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 facts or all those things. They are not no longer, no longer arguing with anybody. They are just collaborating with us cooperating with us and working with the process. It is. Can you tell us how much work it has taken for you to be able to get to the point where when you tweet, it is noticed? It has to do with consistency. It has to do with integrity. It has to do with proving work. It has to do with not just playing to the gallery of work. It has to do with your experience of the industry that you're actually engaging. I have been around the media space for over 10 years. So there was a time I was tweeting to myself. And there was a time I was just engaging the authorities to share ideas for free for many years under this same administration, despite the fact that we don't agree on a lot of things. And they've been listening and they've been engaging and they've been cooperative, they, they, uh, provided, provided they see to it that this has nothing to do with politics, this has nothing to do with um, uh, personal interest, provided they can ascertain the ecclesiastical altruism, as I often say, you know, uh, provided they can also ascertain that you're not doing this for probably grants or funds or anything. We are self-funded. You know, and we're not also raising funds from the public yet. You know, so all these things con contribute to the fact that, oh, these people are setting an example. These people are, they are role models for Nigerians to actually become active citizens who will responsibly engage government. What do you mean by self-funded? What does that mean? Self-funding means that we, we pull funds from our own personal resources because we want to contribute to our nation for the sake of our children. Mm -hmm. Because we have personalized this. This is no longer about doing something because you want something back. But it, to the ordinary Nigerian who yeah. just wants his or her voice heard, who thinks that I see that the president has a handle on Twitter. I see that, you know, from the president to the vice president to the police to, you know, almost all agencies of government now now have to have some online presence. Yeah. I think that is a new policy Sorry. direction yeah. uh, from this particular government. And they just want to be able to engage because all Nigerians should count. All Nigerians should matter. What would you say to them? Well, I think Nigerians have a voice. The social media is potent. However much they are militarizing and weaponizing the cybercrimes act against it. It's not going to work. We need to pull our resources together, pull our voices together and stop working in silos because of funding or grants or so. We should come together and build that political will and give ev an every average citizen on the street their voice in terms of building capacities and building a platform upon which people can find expression. And that's what CF has done. If you notice, there's no longer one lone man crying somewhere in the forest. We get calls from remote areas of Nigeria and we attend to those things within 24 hours. You're able and to take on every single complaint? Yes, we are. 
And we're also working to strengthen the institution and enable the police to do the same and to build trust with the police. Today, the, uh, the uh, complaint uh, response unit of the police is actually getting a lot of calls. Mm. And then we're also engaging to encourage them because this thing can be daunting at times. You know? So that's how it works. We don't build society in silence. We need to come together. We need to get police to understand, the institutions to understand the essence of the feedback from the citizenry and build that bridge over the gap that we have. You're watching Hard Copy coming to you from our studios in Abuja. We're talking about human rights tonight in the light of an example where citizens, through the use of social media, resisted an abusive arm of the police. Shagunwa Wosonya, a.k.a. Sega Link, one of the vibrant voices in that campaign, is our guest tonight. And now we're asking his opinion on attempts by the National Assembly to regulate the social media. I think the entire citizenry, uh, the populace in Nigeria are threatened, not just me, you know. But I, I, I have not been given to fear of anything. I don't operate in that dimension. I believe in engagement. I believe in ensuring that get, government gets clarity, even when they must have been ill-advised. And we've been putting our voice out there. It is, it is an evil intention, and it will go the way it came. Do you think social media should be regulated in any way? You don't regulate social media in an engagement age. You understand the people from their perspective. So if, if you and power resides where men believe it resides. So when people start saying things that are not so, it's because they are threatened. We have seen governments, I think it was only Australia recently, that also enacted uh, stronger cyber crimes uh, law. We've seen, I think, uh, even within the European Union um, and even in the United States, attempts to call Facebook and even Twitter, you know, to, for stronger regulation from their own end. And so we see people like Mark Zuckerberg taking questions from uh, the Senate in the United States in terms of how things are affecting uh, yeah. their own politics and things of the sort. Do you think that we should have that sort of conversation here as to whether we could have external influences or people that have an agenda, powerful people who have an agenda, who mask under, you know, it is the people who are speaking on social media? It starts with transparency and accountability. A government that is not transparent and accountable cannot justify joining the uh, choir of regulating social media for implementation. We know their plans. We know their plots. We've been through change. We are in uh, next level and it does not favor us. So why should we trust another uh, ambiguity that they are trying to bring in? We've seen how they have made the mess of the campaign against uh, uh, corruption and the rest of it. We've seen the implementation. It does not favor us. So why would we encourage another uh, um, uh, attempt to silence free speech. How should we trust them with something that they are hiding under isomorphic mimicry? It's just about the noise. That's what we get until they prove to us or make a believer of us. And that's our, that's our pers perspective. And that's the way every Nigerian that is not being fueled or financed or pushed by some other people to act, that's the way they feel. They so don't feel represented. What more do you think that, I don't know if this is going to be on the part of citizens or on the part of government, uh, and by government, I, I don't just mean the federal government, because yeah. sometimes this is also with the state government. This is also with local government. It would seem that a lot of the anger we have uh, is usually directed at the federal government. Do you think that state governments are getting enough of the heat that they, they, sh they ought to be getting from citizens in the state? I don't think they are getting enough heat from my own perspective. People don't even recognize, they don't even see or feel the presence or the impact or influence of their state governors. I'll give you an example. We're talking about police brutality. Can you actually name any governor that spoke against this, that actually did anything in response to this? You can hardly count. These are the people who collect security votes that are not accountable to anybody on this issue. And they're killing your youth right before your very own eyes and you have not done anything significant is, is about it. Is that a problem with citizens' understanding of how their own federation is structured? Yes, there is a problem. Democracy actually as designed by the Greeks works under education, enlightenment, and, and knowledge, understanding. Nigerians don't understand what democracy means to them. They believe that democracy is all about being paid some money, tokens, and go, uh, stealing ballot boxes and all those things. They don't understand what it means. In those days, original design of democracy is for the unlearned, is for landowners, is for people who understand what is at stake. But the mob action we have today, every Tom, Dick, and Harry who doesn't even understand what the stakes are, are out there voting according to how they are being, you know, programmed. And that's exactly why we are, where we, why we are where we are today. People don't, they believe holding your government to account is hating them. 
They believe, and that's why we are very much against the hate, uh, uh, hate speech bill. Because everything, anything can be swept under that carpet of hate speech mm. for, for, for merely holding people to account. On the one hand, I, I'm just looking at your last statement. Okay. On the one hand, you talk about, you know, it's for the educated. And, you know, that already presupposes a class, a class of people. The people who are educated are supposed to be the ones who know how to use social media. However, sometimes this is not always the situation. Is, isn't that right? You talked about a mob okay. action, yeah. uh, you know, which we, you know, which sometimes the elite will refer to. Uh, can you strike a balance yeah. in terms of, you know, yeah, balancing this mob action, in yeah. quote, with you know, the actions of the educated. I think this is more on the side of the people. When we say that democracy is for the learned, it means that those who do, who do not know must be educated, must be enlightened. We need to reach, each one must reach one to, un, to teach people, to let them know what is at stake, to bring that problem to their doorstep, to let them know how their lack of understanding of how structures work is affecting their children. Because every error, every blunder from the state will be felt by the people, not by the people who have security guards following them all over the place. Let us talk about moving forward. I mean, you have talked about rights. This is not the right. We're not where we ought to be. Yeah. In fact, you say we have retrogressed yeah. when it comes to human rights. Yeah. What would you like to see in a Nigeria where rights are respected? First of all, citizens must be conscious of their rights they must know what is lawful and what is not. It is not legal in any society for police to randomly pick you on the street and ask for your phone. It is tantamount to asking you to remove your trousers for them to verify your, the serial number of your boxers. So you don't do that. But if people don't know, you see our youth today, 70% of our population is youthful. And then you see people going on the street saying, I gave my phone to the officer because he asked on the highway, because I have nothing to hide. You have already waived your right. The moment you do that. So simple education. And the moment you are aware of all these things, it becomes, it, it, people stop, you know, exploiting your ignorance. And that's exactly where it starts. But it, isn't that a problem? Because here you say people should, you know, don't let their ignorance be exploited. However, in some instances, Nigerians do feel powerless when someone is holding a gun and is asking them to say, bring your phone. If you have nothing to hide, Oftentimes, the instinct is to give away your phone. In that instance, does it really make sense? Is it really common sense in a situation where we know that stray bullets are common uh, to say, no, I'm, I'm holding on to my right? Yeah, I'm sure you know that in the past three years since our engage engagement, you've not heard anything about accidental discharge or stray bullets. We get the shooter because somebody is monitoring the system. People don't do what you expect. They do what you inspect. So if there are people on ground to monitor the system, it will be accountable In to the us. last three I years, I'm sure, yes, <coughs> I, I yeah. know that there are incidences where, we, I mean, there was this uh, young man who was killed somewhere in Guagada. Yeah. I'm trying to remember his name. because Colade Johnson. Colade Johnson was, the case. was also an example. But he was an example. I mean, this happened in the last three years. And nobody wants to be that name that, you know, lost his or her life because you refused to give your phone when, or when your I'm wallet saying, to an officer. You, don't, you can be decorous while you're actually proving your right to people. And the moment you see that this, you made the officer know that you are actually going against the law because I know my rights, but I am letting you go. I'm letting you have your way because I'm, I know that this is not fatalistic. I am coming back to get my own share of the justice. So after the fact, you can always report. The moment you report within 24 hours, those officers will be rounded up. Your money will be retrieved and they will be, ex they will, they will be, uh, they will be dismissed and charged to court for armed robbery. You are very confident that this is how the... It, is, it has been happening. The records are there. We are going to release our three-year uh, report very soon, which will follow the launch, official launch of the organization. Then you see the kind of traction we'll be making. So in some ways, it will seem that it is getting better, but in other places, it's getting worse. Well, it is getting better. We do actually don't have data of how much of the prevalence of what has been happening uh, uh, are... But right now, because of social media and the awareness, the light is actually shining on the dark part of the whole thing. And it will seem like everything is getting worse because people are speaking out more now. So we have a lot of things that we have been able to achieve across the states in Nigeria. Lagos, for instance, we don't have such problem again in Lagos. The only problem we have now is pockets of anti-cultism, anti-kidnapping, you know, going outside their standard opera opera operation procedures. And they are always apprehended because we know them. How many are these people? 
So mm. if you keep reporting, be assured that justice will be served. Even if you live in areas where network don't work, just call. The numbers to call are there. They're on social media. Right. So that, that's how it is. We're working and we're getting there. That's where we wrap up tonight. But you can tell us your experience, if any at all, with the reformed SARS using their handles on your screen. We all must remember in the end that indeed our rights are guaranteed under the Constitution. However, they would not uphold themselves. We must work to uphold them, not just for the strong, but for the most vulnerable as well. This is the foundation for a just society. On that note, we say thank you for watching. I'm Maokpai Ogun Yusuf. Good night. <laughs>